Hey everybody, how's it going? I hope you're having a lovely Sunday morning. Today we're going to be going over a news piece that comes from New Zealand from One News. It says a laptop owner is baffled over two very different repair quotes. And if you've been watching this channel for more than 20 seconds, you probably know where this is going. A woman brought her laptop to an Apple authorized service provider. She had a MacBook Air that wasn't turning on. And they quoted her $1,822.75, which I believe is $1,075.79 in US dollars. She then took it to an independent that quoted her way, way less than that. And I wanted to really dig into this for a number of reasons, because A, this is something that essentially has not been fixed in at least five years since uh, this CBC national news piece came out that got tens of millions of views on my channel and theirs, and B, kind of go over the difference between incompetence and malice. There are many people that say you should not attribute to malice what you can attribute to stupidity. But I think there's a genuine philosophical question here is if you know that your actions are stupid and you know how your actions are affecting others and you do nothing, at what point does that stupidity become malice if it is not addressed? Which is something that I think we should dig into here. She was quoted 1000 75 US dollars and 79 cents. And if you take a look at apple.com, you'll see that, again, when you take a look at a MacBook Air, this is pretty much the cost of replacing the MacBook Air. That's a problem. Let's dig into this quote. So the Apple authorized service provider said the audio board needed to be replaced. The audio board flex needed to be replaced. The top case needed to be replaced. The touch ID button needed to be replaced. The display needed to be replaced. And after they took it to an independent, the problem was a shorted capacitor on pp 3 op Technically, they said a shorted capacitor. They didn't say what, but given that this is a T2 chip model and that the technician stated that it was stuck at 5 volts and not going up to 20 volts, this tends to mean that a pp by D3 hot capacitor was short to ground. And that model, that's 99% of the time what happens when you have are stuck at 5 volts and not going to 20. And it is a short capacitor. So there was a short to ground and a main power rail. So this begs uh, two questions. The first question is, if the problem was on the logic board, why is it that Apple's quote included everything besides the logic board? They included the audio board, the audio board flex, uh, the top case, the touch ID button, and the display. But there's no mention of replacing the main logic board. So Apple's quote, unless the news is getting something wrong, and I am open to the idea that the news got something wrong, is literally to replace every part of the computer besides the part of the computer that actually had the problem. So you're going to charge the customer pretty much what the computer actually costs to buy in the retail store. And you're going to replace everything in that computer besides the one part that actually needs to be replaced. Really now. The reason I find this interesting is because when the CBC did this piece with me, Apple told them it would be $1,100 with a labor of 100 and then if they needed to replace another part, it would be 780 So I'm very curious here, would they have actually come back to this customer after telling the customer that you need to spend $1,075 to fix an $1,100 computer and tell them you actually need a motherboard too, that's going to be $1,500 to replace your $1,100 computer. There's a very good likelihood that that would have actually happened because again, this is literally a quote for everything besides the part that is broken. The second thing that I think is really important here here is that I'm very curious what the troubleshooting process was to ascertain that everything besides the actual problem with the computer was what needed to be replaced. I would love for a transparent vetting of that entire process. Multimeter, plugging into another computer. Did you plug that screen into another computer to see that it was bad? Did you plug that trackpad or that keyboard into another machine to see that it's bad? Did you plug any of these parts into a known good setup to see if they actually worked or not? Or are you just saying that all these parts are bad willy-nilly for no good reason? Now, the piece says that there was some moisture that might have been in there. But what I find interesting is that PP Bush D3 hot shorts on that particular model don't tend to occur from that. They tend to occur from a one of those capacitors exploding and going boom. You could see many of the capacitors that I go over on my channel. Usually it's the tantalum ones. I'm not sure if it was the tantalum one here that winds up just kind of shorting the ground and turning into a mini volcano and they're actually kind of cool to look at sometimes. They did claim that there was moisture in there and the independent said that there was a residue, but there was no corrosion. This is a very important part. There was a residue, but no corrosion. So for all you know, this could have literally been humidity or moisture in the air, but it was not on the main motherboard. Very important point to make. Uh, the customer claims that they did not get liquid on it. In Apple's defense here, everybody lies. As, as Hao says, every, everybody lies. Literally every single day we have machines with corroded motherboards that come in and the customer says, I never spilled anything on it. I smell it. It smells like coconut flavored coffee creamer. And it's like, come on, who are you kidding? But in this case, the liquid was not on the motherboard and it was not corroded in any way, shape or form, which is really important to mention. Now, what I find interesting is after this news story came out where the machine was fixed for a few hundred by the independent when the authorized service provider wanted almost $1,100 is that the authorized service provider offered to give her a brand new MacBook Air. But again, that's only after giving her an almost $1,100 repair quote to fix what is essentially an $1,100 computer. 
after the news covered it. This is kind of like me offering to buy my wife flowers and apologize to her after a video goes viral of me beating her that I didn't know was recorded. Uh, and to be clear, 100% clear, to, in my opinion, this is not a scam. This is incompetence. This is systematic, bureaucratic incompetence. But again, this does bring up a very interesting philosophical question. When incompetence becomes regular and commonplace, and it is brought to light, and it has been brought to light for over five years, and nothing changes, at what point does that incompetence become weaponized incompetence, aka malice? You should not attribute to malice what you can attribute to stupidity. But if you know you're doing something stupid, you continue to do the stupid thing, and people who are smarter than you, that are your superior at a company that has hundreds of billions of dollars in the bank, do nothing to change their processes, at what point is it malice to allow somebody to continue to do something stupid? I'll give you an example with my own particular business. I had a payment system that was double charging people approximately nine years ago. When it was brought to my attention, I realized it was affecting more than just that one customer that was complaining, but nobody had said anything about it. There are four things I can do at this point. Behind door number one, I can just pretend that there's no problem. There's nothing wrong. Behind door number two, I can acknowledge the problem, but only fix it for the people who complain and just have willful blindness and never look into my payment system. Behind door number three, I can look into the problem to figure out why it's double billing people and then just still never fix it unless you call me to complain. And all the other people that get double charged don't check their statements. Well, they didn't check their statements. Or behind door number four, I can acknowledge the problem and fix it for those who complain. I can look into what's causing the problem. I can fix the problem retroactively for everybody who's had that problem. And I can fix my systems so that that never happens again. In my opinion, while two and three allow you to technically claim that you weren't aware or that it was stupidity and not malice, once it's pointed out to you that something is wrong, once you know that something is wrong and it continues to happen year after year after year after year after year, you are complicit. That does count as malice. This is weaponized incompetence at this point, and I think that it's really important to bring up. Another point that I think is really important to bring up here is a term that my good friend and colleague Jessa Jones has said many times, is that we should not be calling this authorized repair. We should be calling it branded repair for two reasons. The first is that the term authorized repair implies in the name that you must be authorized. Somebody else has the ability to revoke your permissions to work on your personal property, which is a concept that I find to be personally repugnant and disgusting. You do not need somebody else's authorization to work on your hardware or your device. That is not for Apple to give. That is not for any other company to give when it comes to working on your personal property. The second point is that they are not actually authorized to fix anything. I'm sorry, did they take a multimeter to this computer? Did they plug that display that they said was bad into another device to test if it works? Did they plug any of the pieces that they said they needed to replace into a known good to see if those pieces actually needed to be replaced, which is a standard practice? No, they didn't. They are not authorized to actually fix anything. They are not given access to schematics or board views. They do not have multimeters in the Apple authorized service centers. They do not take the parts out and actually plug them into other housings to see if anything is bad. Nothing going on here has anything to do with service or repair. This is not authorized repair because they are not actually authorized to do anything that would be called repair. If they were, this would not happen. Things like this do not happen on a regular basis across the country, across the world, unless your processors are so fundamentally against actual troubleshooting, diagnosis, and repair that you no longer can call a repair. And I would argue that none of this is repair. Whether we are talking about today or eight years ago when Apple authorized service providers were telling customers that the iPhone 6 charge port was hard soldered onto the motherboard. No. Unfortunately not. The headphone jack is basically hard soldered directly into the logic board. Okay, so you're, so the hard, you're saying that on the iPhone 6, the headphone jack is hard soldered, it's soldered directly on the motherboard? Mm-hmm. Okay. Not only do they have no concept of how to diagnose or repair their own hardware, they don't even know how it's put together. To call this authorized repair assumes that A, they're authorized to do something, B, they're qualified or competent to actually perform repairs which they're obviously not. It's not even a question of, oh, somebody was careless that day. Fundamentally, their systems are so bad that if I repeat this call over and over and over again, I will continue to get the same answer from every single place that I call because they have no need to have this knowledge because they don't actually fix anything. Most of these authorized repair facilities are not actually performing repairs. They don't need this knowledge because that's not what they do. And this is something that I think needs to become more common knowledge because... I, again, if this is considered news in 2023, 
Obviously, it's not. The second reason I think it needs to become more common knowledge is because if more people realize that when they go to the authorized repair provider that they know nothing about how the device is even put together, much less how to fix it, that they may feel excited to give it a try on their own. They may want to, even if they're not able to fix it, learn something, which is what we're trying to do here with Repair.Wiki. We're trying to make it very easy for people that have less experience to be able to really understand how their devices are put together, what the common failure modes are, why those failure modes occur, and how to fix them so that you can be more educated and be able to fix your own products for free. That's what we're doing here with Repair.Wiki, which is part of my Right to Repair nonprofit, Repair Preservation Group, which provides educational guides to you for free. And that's what we're going to continue to do into the future. We tried to bring attention to this problem in a piece that was done five years ago. And in this piece, this is very fun for me. I actually got them to change what they were going to do the piece on. When I originally received the call from Alex, they asked if I wanted to do a piece on how Apple is bad with updates, which I went over in this video here. And in my opinion, that would not be fun. News should never have a conclusion that is predetermined. News should be about discovering what is. So I asked them if they'd be open to a different idea. Would you be open to finding a broken MacBook from a recycler or something, taking it to Apple, asking them what's wrong with it, and then taking it to me and asking what's wrong with it with a hidden camera? It'll be fun. And the, part of what makes it fun is you never know. Maybe you would have had a dead PCH and it would have been something that was not liquid damage, which would have been covered under Apple's flat rate program where they would have had a better price than me. But I just figured rolling the dice that most of the the time they say something stupid. And they did. They told this customer that it was going to cost about $2,000 for what was essentially a display cable. And to this day, years later, you will still see people say things like, this guy again? I'm pretty sure he makes his money ranting conspiracies about Apple on YouTube. The repair business is just a beard. There are people that to this day, in their heart of hearts, genuinely believe that I have six to 12 people on payroll just for the appearance that I fix things. But I don't actually fix things. I make my money off of a YouTube channel that has about 50 to 100,000 views a day. <laughs> to some people, this is actually news. And it's news that they're not going to accept because their identity is so ingrained with a particular brand or company that they cannot believe that that company would actually do something that is wrong. And it's gonna be hard to change that. At the end of the day, many people will ask, what are my incentive structures? What are my motivations for doing these videos? Take a look at what I'm asking. I'm asking for them to A, make available parts, tools, schematics, and diagrams and everything to not just us, but at least their own repair people so that they have the ability to do these repairs a little better and be a little less incompetent. And more importantly, just take a look at your own internal repair practices. Reflect a little bit on what could be different so that the customer has a better experience. At the end of the day, I want people to have better experiences with repair across the board, even if that means they're not coming to me. Think about it. What I'm doing here is I'm asking them to change a little bit in a way that would be beneficial to their customers. If Apple treated their customers better, do you honestly believe in your heart of hearts that 15 years ago, before I had an office, before my setup was even remotely professional in the traditional sense of the word, when I was working out of Herald Square Park with an extension cord that attached to the other side of the park so that I could plug my soldering iron in, do you think that people would have been coming to me instead of the Apple store? No way in hell. The reason that people were willing to come to me when I was 19 years old in Herald Square Park, no certification, no nothing, no store, no even business phone number, is because the service that they received at the Apple Store was so horrible that they didn't even care. In their mind, if I'm going to be paying $1,075 to fix an $1,100 product, I might as well risk it with the guy in the park. If he steals my computer or runs off or stabs it, I'm still better off than I would have been going to the Apple store. If Apple treated their customers better when it came to repair, there would be no need for me. The reason that I have the demand that I do for my services, the reason my business has dozens of boxes coming into it every single day and other businesses do across the country is because Apple is not handling these repairs properly. If they did, I strongly believe if they actually listen to what it is I advocate for, there might not even be a need for me anymore. But there is, because they're going to keep doing this and nothing is going to change. And people who post on forums are going to defend every single thing that Apple does to the death, because to them, they are not defending Apple, they are defending themselves. Once they identify with the company, and once the company is a part of their identity, it is very difficult to root that out, to be able to actually criticize anything they do that's wrong, even if it's something that would actually screw you. At the end of the day, what I advocate for is for Apple to treat the customer better, even if that person would never become my customer as a result of Apple treating them better. 
let me know what you think in the comments down below. That's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. And if you're open to opening a machine, tinkering a little bit, check out Repair.Wiki. It's completely free, and I employ people that post guides to it so that you can learn how to do this stuff from people who are professional technicians in the industry that do this for a living. We don't just go into the, you know, here's how you take the bottom cover off kind of stuff. We try to really dig into the nitty gritty details and go over stuff that you're just not going to find in a lot of other places in a centralized way. From guides and Mac motherboard repair and troubleshooting to guides and how to deal with iPhones and iPads that randomly crash and reboot, articles on how to fix an iPad Air 3 with no backlight, we are always adding content. There is no subscription. There is no paywall. You're welcome to view it all for free. We encourage you to learn, but more importantly, once you learn things that are not on the wiki, we encourage you to contribute your own repair guides and content so that other people may learn as well. That's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. Happy repairing. Bye now.